Hello and welcome to the third of our Discover SLM Talks. My name is Nerida Campbell and I'm currently the Acting Head of Curatorial at Sydney Living Museums. I particularly want to extend a warm welcome to our members, donors and supporters. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I live and currently work. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Curators at SLM are constantly discovering new stories about the people, places and things we care for at our 12 sites. During this talk series, we will be sharing some of this research with you as we explore a range of subjects from food to furnishing textiles, from celebrity marriages to colonial bungalows. So keep an eye out for future talks about your favourite subject or for the incurably curious Tune in every Tuesday at 12 to 12.30 for a new topic. There will be time for questions at the end of each talk. Just add them to the Zoom chat. Today's speaker is Dr. Matthew Stevens, who is a research librarian at the Caroline Simpson Library and Research Collection. He is fascinated by early book and sheet music collections in New South Wales and the stories they tell. Matthew leads the digitization and interpretation of SLM's sheet music collections and is a contributor to the forthcoming book, Sound Heritage, Making Music Matter in, house, in Historic Houses. He has represented SLM in performance and research collaborations with the Sydney Conservatorium of Music and the Universities of Southampton and Glasgow in the UK. In 2019, Matthew curated SLM's Songs of Home exhibition, which examined the musical landscape of New South Wales during the 70 years of European settlement. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Nerida. I'll just share my screen with everybody. I'm speaking to you from the Blue Mountains, which is located within the Ngurra, the country of the traditional owners who I acknowledge, the Darug and the Gundungurra people. I was, uh, today I'd like to explore the role of music in relation to our historic house museums at Sydney Living Museums. In doing so, I'll be focusing on the music related objects and resources we find either within these houses or those externally that help pro provide the context. I should mention that I won't be playing any recordings through Zoom today, but there will be lots of opportunity to explore musical examples after my talk through our webpage. But first, I'd like to think, you to think about your home. Imagine if a music researcher dropped in while you were out. And given that most of us are in lockdown, let's imagine you're out exercising. This researcher is interested in how people engage with music in the home. There may or may not be musical instruments. There may be sheet music. There may be a hi-fi of some description records, CDs, an iPhone, and there may be headphones or earbuds. Even with all this evidence, without you being there, it will be hard to gauge what musical activity, whether individual or social, was being made or enjoyed in your house. It will be hard to know much about the individual musical taste of the occupants too. The researcher could hide in the garden and listen for musical activity when the residents are home. I realise this is not the most ethical of our research studies, our researchers may hear someone singing a song in the shower and interested not only in the choice of song, but also in the way the singer uses their voice. Do they sing in a poppy or operatic way? And do they decorate the tune by adding extra notes and twiddles? However, increasingly, the use of earbuds and headphones means the contemporary home may make no audible musical sounds at all. Ironically, given this quiet contemporary soundscape, a lack of sound is sometimes a criticism levelled at house museums, quiet spaces that feel like they are missing the sounds of a living home. Again, we do have musical objects in the houses to offer clues to past musical activity, but we certainly can't eavesdrop on their former occupants. Thankfully, our houses include many clues, such as the objects that both belong to the early inhabitants of houses like Rouse Hill Estate and at Marugal in Nowra, or are illustrative of a reconstructed house interior captured at a particular point in time, like at Elizabeth Bay House, which focuses on the 1840s, Vaucluse House, a little later, as well as Susanna Place in the Rocks, which illustrates a range of periods. In addition to objects like musical instruments or sheet music, 
we turn to diaries, paintings, photographs, uh, and pedagogical publications like piano and singing tutors. We also work with Australian music historians and expert musicians, including First Nations people, to help understand what the musical soundscape in and around these houses may have been like. Stories about musical activity, such as Elizabeth Farm at Parramatta, can offer some of the most powerful ways of thinking about these houses in terms of music. Here is a photograph of what some people believe is the first piano to have arrived in Australia, temporarily positioned in, a dining, in the dining room of Elizabeth Farm. A small square piano, this one or one like it, was transported to Australia by Mr George Worgan of the First Fleet in 1788 and which he gave to Elizabeth MacArthur not long after. For me, one of the most extraordinary images of Australian colonialism is imagining Mrs MacArthur sitting in her drawing room at Elizabeth Farm in the early 1790s and picking out a tune on what was the only piano on the Australian continent. What gives this story even greater power is imagining what the first peoples made of this new sound on their land and the tunes it carried down to the Parramatta River. When I talk about reflecting on the history of music making in SLM's historic properties, I mean we are interested in the entire musical soundscape. While most of the music I'll mention today relates to 19th century instruments and repertoire from our collection, SLM is keen to encourage all musical inspiration, whether it's classical, folk, rap, or any genre. And in recent years, we have commissioned indigenous and non-indigenous musicians to reflect on our history through new musical composition. It is not uncommon for house museums to want to explore music, and SLM has been making music in its houses almost since it was established as the Historic Houses Trust in 1980. Until relatively recently, I would argue that most the most common approach to music making in our houses was to match people who played identifiably historical music with an historical room, regardless of whether there was any relationship between the two. This can be a wonderful experience, and I'm the first to enjoy music I like in a beautiful space. And it's worth noting that music's role in many of our public programs is to add to the mood and may not be about history at all. However, over the last six years or so, we have asked ourselves whether there is a better way of linking the musical objects we hold in our collections to the historical spaces we care for, and ultimately connecting the resulting soundscapes with our audiences. And I might add that some of those wonderful performers illustrated in this slide, such as Jennifer Erickson and Tommy Anderson, have been working with us just in the last 12 months while we explore this new approach to our collections and music. So what do I mean by this new approach? At its simplest, it begins with a series of questions we might ask about any of our house museums. How did people make music at home in the past? What types of music did they play? What instruments did they play? Who did they play music with? What interpretive techniques did they use to play their music? And who taught them, if anyone? And how was this actively manifested in the house itself? To answer these questions, we first look at our collections. Houses like Marugal and Rouse Hill House offer lots of inspiration in the form of sheet music, instruments, and diary and newspaper accounts of music making by the residents. Other of our houses, like Elizabeth Bay House and Vaucluse House, have little original musical material to offer, but diaries and letters offers cl offer clues, as well as the reconstructed interiors. These houses are also large and robust enough to invite musicians and audiences into their spaces to explore the broader historical context of music in Sydney and New South Wales. Our first real test of this approach was a collaborative education program between SLM and the Historical Performance Division at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, held in 2016. 25 performance students under the direction of historical pianist, Professor Neil Perez de Costa, were given a tour of SLM's Carol Simpson Library and shown 19th century printed domestic manuals, books, periodicals, and early photographs illustrating and contextualizing houses, interiors, furniture, and musical instruments of the 19th century. They were also shown many examples of sheet music provenance to early 19th century Australian settlers. Over a period of two months, the students made weekly visits to the house to discuss and rehearse music that had belonged to Sydney residents in the 1830s and 40s. Museum visitors thoroughly enjoyed the lively atmosphere 
as music drifted around the house over these weeks. And we're also fascinated by the teaching process on show. The program concluded with a series of intimate concerts in the drawing room in which the audience was immersed in the musical world the students had discovered on their journey. Filling a house with music that may have been heard by its early residents is not as easy as it sounds. The music played in these houses is often quite obscure and unknown to contemporary musicians. Our music collections are dominated by works by composers like Bishop, Balfe, Cherny, Playel and Mazingi with a little bit of Mozart thrown in. Better known composers today like Beethoven, Schubert and Schumann only start to appear in the collections from the 1850s and 1860s. So not only are we asking musicians to virtually throw away the repertoire they know, but we also want people expert in performing historical repertoire with a knowledge of historical performance methods. Luckily, we've been working with some terrific musicians prepared to come for the ride and who are interested in experimenting with a little known aspect of Sydney's early sound world. One unexpected area of strong interest for musicians has been the extensive Scottish repertoire we hold in our collections. This strong representation of Scottish tunes is due to the huge popularity of Scottish and pseudo-Scottish music in Britain during the late 18th and 19th centuries. It works particularly well in terms of house museums because it is a genre that crosses class boundaries. It is quite likely that someone laboring in the grounds of any of our houses would have whistled along to a familiar Scottish ditty emanating from the drawing room. These three recent recordings were made using many of the musical scores in the Stuart Simon sheet music collection at the Carolyn Simpson Library. This generous gift made by the late Stuart Simons in 2016 consists of 1500 pieces of which many were owned by immigrants and residents in 19th century New South Wales. The recordings were the result of collaborations between SLM and musicians and research institutions here and in the UK. While concerns, the concerts in Elizabeth Bay House have also been a feature of some of these projects, the digital availability of these performances enables this early immigrant musical experience to be shared with the world. The need to be able to share this music digitally is particularly important in house museums like Rouse Hill Estate, where the generations of family possessions displayed in a fragile building make it a challenging place in which to perform. Two recent projects have helped communicate the musical story of the house to a broader audience online. In the first project, the Sydney Children's Choir selected a song called The Letter by Samuel Lover from an early volume of music in the house. The music was arranged for the choir by composer Jessica Wells as a two-part choral work for 22 voices and accompanied by piano and violin. The choir rehearsed and made an audio recording with the choir's director, Lynn Williams, before visiting Rouse Hill Estate for a house tour and filming. The second project at Rouse Hill Estate and SLM's most recent music project, House Music at Your House, was a response to the COVID pandemic and was proposed and directed by violist and educator, Nicole Forsyth, and with the support of the City of Sydney Council. Over the second half of 2020, the program provided an opportunity for musicians and music audiences to explore 18 songs using the Rouse Hill Estate Sheet Music Collection. Professional musicians recorded videos of their own interpretations of these pieces from home and a mix of digitized scores, guitar chords, recorded accompaniments and other online examples were added to inspire the public to share their own versions. It will come as no surprise that the type of music found in Rouse Hill House is heavily European focused with a strong colonial thread. While there are some early Australian compositions that include arrangements of Aboriginal tunes heard in the early 19th century, none of these have been found at Rouse Hill Estate. SLM is currently a partner in an Australian Research Council discovery grant with the University of Sydney in which we're exploring the world of music in New South Wales up until 1860. The project covers both Indigenous and colonial music making during this period. It includes some exciting work which Aboriginal communities will interpret the language and tunes found in early remnant European transcriptions from their country. For the House Music at Your House program, we asked Yua Laraway, storyteller and musician Nadi Simpson for a response to the music collection at Rouse Hill. She chose the song Hearts and Homes by Charlotte Young and John Blockley. 
And this was a song recorded in newspapers and family music collections, at least far north as the Clarence River area, and further south in the Hunter Valley, Sydney, Rouse Hill, Goulburn and Wagga Wagga. These important songs permeated the soundscape of homesteads and towns, and inevitably the country of First Nations. Nadi translated the song into her own language, with additions and referencing the omnomatopoeic word for heart in the Darak language, but but, and the possum skin drumming of her ancestors. Nadi accompanied herself with a firm, steady beat on a wallaby hide. This recording and many of the performances I've mentioned today are available via our website, and I'll give you the access details at the end of this talk. As I've said, walk into any of our houses and you will find numerous objects offering clues to the role of music in past lives. You may have noticed that all my illustrations of our houses include a piano. This instrument is the most common way of alluding to musical activity in a house museum and they were incredibly common in Australian homes by the mid 19th century. I'd like to spend a couple of minutes discussing a particularly interesting piano in our collection that illustrates some of the challenges we face when considering an, an interpretation of music in these houses. In these two images, you can see the same piano, a square piano made in around 1826 by a firm called Litchfield Binks and photographed over an 80 year period. You can see it on the left in Vaucluse House in 1933 and on the right in Elizabeth Bay House in 2016. The desire to represent the world of music at Vaucluse House occurred strikingly early in its development as a museum. In the late 1920s, within a decade of establishing the site as a house museum, the Vaucluse House trustees began to focus on how to approach music in an historical setting. This included the acquisition of musical instruments, choosing repertoire and engaging with the local community to promote music, dance and pageants in the house. This English square piano was acquired by the trustees in 1929 and the correspondence relating to its acquisition, restoration and interpretation has been preserved. The piano had been brought to Australia in around 1882 by Thomas and Rose Tunstall when they emigrated here and had belonged to Rose's grandmother, Anne Taylor of Enfield, Middlesex. According to family stories, Anne owned the piano well before the 1850s. After some confusion as to whether it was a piano or a Queen Anne harpsichord, it was purchased by the trustees so that music, such as gavots, could be played in the house. It was also suggested that a Madame Evelyn Grieg, who in the 1920s was well known for her performances of Scarlatti on the dulcetone, a keyboard instrument invented in the 1860s, and also known for her music history lectures on local radio, should be employed to play the piano at the house. This desire to reflect upon the house's history through performance was also of interest to the Vaucluse Music Club. On the 6th of December, 1930, a pageant, Shades of Old Vaucluse, was presented on the veranda of the house where performers revisited the old haunts of Vaucluse House. The script survives and music, most likely performed on the Litchfield Wings piano, was used to accompany dancers, demonstrating waltzes from years gone by. Undoubtedly, this account highlights how a lack of knowledge about an instrument, its context or repertoire may now seem naive. Not being sure whether it is a piano or a harpsichord, or whether it is 100, 200 or 500 years old is a pretty basic obstacle to interpretation. Nevertheless, the required technical knowledge about historical instruments, their repertoire and playing methods is no, simple, is no simpler today. The Litchfield Binks piano has probably not been played at least since the 1960s and is unplayable in its current state. Some time ago, it was moved from Borkley's house to Elizabeth Bay House to help interpret the morning room as the 1826 piano matched the year of the Maclay family's departure to Australia. Over the years, we've had discussions about whether the piano should be restored. An, internal expert, an international expert in square pianos has confirmed that the instrument is structurally secure and should have a sweet sound. She also observed the bizarre eggplant colored French polish must have been applied when the piano was restored in 1930. However, the decision to restore is not straightforward. The conservation care and interpretive approach to such an instrument is now more sophisticated than when the piano was first restored in 1930. SLN's conservation keyboard consultant, Bronwyn Griffin, notes what an exciting provenance this piano has. 
She says that if we can identify a direct line of ownership from the present day to the piano's manufacturer in the 1820s, this is rare. She reminds us that the biggest challenge is to decide on a treatment approach which preserves as much of the physical evidence of the story as possible, from the maker's original work and any evidence of use to the repairs carried out for Vaucluse House in the 1930s and 1960s. While working with early keyboard specialist repairer Colin Vanderleck, Bronwyn has photographed and documented the current condition of the instrument. She notes that to restore the piano to playing condition would require replacement of original or early components, such as the leather hinges for the hammers and some hammer coverings. Any changes would need to be documented and any components that are removed should be retained for further reference. Where possible, examples of original material should be left on the instrument. For the time being, the piano has been cleaned and stabilised, and despite its unplayable state, strongly supports the visual interpretation of the interior of Elizabeth Bay House. As a tool for performance, it is less of a priority. Of course, we have had access to other fine early keyboards for our concerts. These early instruments have a lightness of sound and timbre that is distinct from later pianos and matches the earlier repertoire common in these houses. It also better supports the sound of other 19th century instruments, as well as approaches to singing this style of music. If you'd like to read more about making music in historic houses, I'd like to finish with a plug for a new book SLM has partnered with the University of Southampton and the Royal College of Music. Called Sound Heritage Making Music Matter in Historic Houses and published by Rutledge later this year, the book is an exploration of museum and research projects around the world interested in music, um, music in historic houses. There are a number of Australian contributors and the book includes a chapter on his approach to music in SLM's home, muse home museums over the last 40 years. We will have a copy at the Carolyn Simpson Library when we reopen. I'd also encourage you to explore the SLM Music webpage, to read our music related stories and to enjoy the many audio and video recordings we have available. If you'd like to have a go at trying out some of the 400 digitized scores we have created, I'd encourage you to visit our Internet Archive sheet music collection available via the same web page. It can be really addictive. Here is the, uh, the URL to get to our web page, or you can just search Google uh, uh, Music SLM. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matt. I particularly like that idea of the music wafting out of one of our rooms and the gardeners and other people hearing it and humming along. What a beautiful idea. We've got a few questions for you. And if anybody has any other questions, feel free to drop them into the chat as, as um, Matt's answering. So the first one is from Hayley. She'd like to know, do you have a favourite musical piece in the SLM's collection? Oh, that's a hard one. It's like, which is your favourite property at SLM? It's always the last one you visited, I think, is the way it usually works. Um, I Look, there are many favourite pieces, and not always because I even particularly like them. <laughs> it depends. Um, uh, I think my favourite piece at the moment is a song called I Think of Thee, um, and it's a really interesting song because we have the only known copy of this song, um, and we have a few of those that we found in the collection, um, it's an Australian composition that was written in 1846 by a composer called Frederick Ellard. He was only about 18, I think. He was a, a very young man at the time. Um, it's a really interesting piece. It's based on a poem by Goethe, so it's not unsophisticated. Um, it was published by his father, Francis Ellard, who was a very well-known uh, music instrument seller and uh, music seller and printer. And um, it was missing the last page. So we had to, uh, we commissioned our musical consultant, Dr. Graham Skinner, who's been invaluable in all of our interpretation of the last decade, and he reconstructed the last page. And then we um, asked a wonderful singer, Amy Moore, to actually record it for us. And so I, it's, a, it's a construction of ours very much and uh, quite a beautiful song. So I encourage people to listen to it, actually. I'll be able to find it on our webpage. Awesome. We've got a question from Gabrielle who wants to know what periods of music do you concentrate on at SLM? At the moment, um, we've really been focusing on 19th century um, music and particularly early, actually, which is quite a challenge. But um, a lot of our work has been 19, uh, 1830s, 1840s. 
um, to start with. And then we've also had, we've dabbled in the 50s and the 60s as well. And that's quite a range of styles as well. Some of it's quite folky, uh, some of it's American. Once the gold rush hits, we get stuck in quite a few American tunes arriving. Um, uh, so quite a nice range. Thank you. Uh, Jahan would like to know, how did you collaborate on the book? Was there consensus on the approach to music in historic houses? Ah, <laughs> there's a re it's really worth looking at the book. Um, it's literally going to publish the next week, so I've just been looking at it a bit. Um, there's a real range of contributions. Um, uh, you'll find that there are some of the British contributions will be interested in sort of quite large country houses. Um, we don't have those in Australia. Um, the Australian contributions, of course, are interested in smaller, uh, more personal buildings. Um, we're lucky in Australia that we do actually still have some really good collections within the houses like SLM. Um, so that's actually really quite rare internationally as well. We have contributions from India uh, to Gore's house, which is very, very fascinating. Um, the Bach archive. Um, we have an, uh, a chapter by some um, um, uh, researchers in France who are looking at how the... Um, the kings of France listen to music, so they're recreating the sound of music in their homes or their chapels. So as you can see, it's quite an interesting range. America, um, uh, some, very, some very interesting work from America as well. So we, we had a, a three-day conference in London in 2019, which was an absolute pleasure and luxury. And anyone writing a book, I recommend it. We all got together in London at the Royal College of Music from all over the world and um, presented what we wanted to do and then sort of really thought through what, what did we all mean? And, uh, and then came back with our chapters having had that three day discussion. So it's, 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 it's I think a very connected um, uh, group of um, essays, I hope. Sounds very collaborative. It was, yeah. I have another question um, and it's from Gabrielle. I have family members involved in music at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. Do, can you recommend places for researching these periods? Yes, the Carolyn Simpson Library <laughs> is number one, um, because we can probably help you a lot in, in understanding what you have or what your, your family might have played. And we do have lots of examples, both in the Carolyn Simpson Library and in our houses, and those are increasingly getting documented um, and publicly available. Um, State Library of New South Wales, an amazing source as well. There's so much wonderful material there. The National Library also has an incredible collection of music. Um, and, and a lot of that is online. A lot of that has been digitised, particularly Australian music. Uh, that's their focus. And that's one point I should make, actually, that what I think we're doing that is different is that we are thinking about the whole soundscape and it's not actually necessarily Australian compositions. We obviously focus on that and... Um, well, our state library and our, our national library will focus on the music that was written and composed in Australia from, from whenever. Um, whereas we're actually saying, but what did people actually hear? And to be honest, a lot of it wasn't Australian. It, it's this quite unusual and often very beautiful music that we don't know anymore that's sitting in our houses, in our libraries. Um, and that's what we're recreating. It's a combination of, of British, European, American um, and other places. We've got time for one last question, Matt. Yep. Um, and it is, what is the most surprising thing you found out about music in your research into Sydney Living Museum's houses? I think the most surprising thing, well, one of them, is that there are so many clues, or there can be clues within the musical scores about how people actually performed. And that's something we've really enjoyed experimenting with. Uh, if people scribble, they scribble their ornaments, what they did, uh, even in the 1830s, which is what we did with the Dowling Project, um, and we can actually then try and have a go at speaking to them through their own, their own scribbles. Um, who knows how close we get? It's a very informed way of doing it. Um, but I think that's been the most surprising thing, and I think that's really surprising for a lot of young musician students, musical students, that there are Australian sources um, in Australian houses. And I think that's been a quite a surprise for the, the students that come from the con and work with us and really exciting that they are getting excited that there is a musical history that they can learn about in Australia. Well, thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, join us again next week, same time. We'll be looking at the Burdekin House columns next week. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thanks.